Yeah, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, morning seminar. <laughs> I will start and hand over uh, the word. Le Leila Jungberg, she has been working with teaming and doing a lot in what you call agile environments and, and driving this. But uh, what I know her also a lot from is that she is the contributor to the book that uh, Pia Maria uh, has written. So if you have written, if you had read the book, you surely have uh, heard uh, some of uh, the sayings from Leila. So I will hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Ingla, for, for that introduction. <clears throat> yeah, that was many years ago, that book. <laughs> uh, and that was uh, fantastic and great. And uh, I hope that it provided some insights for you if you read it. <laughs> so my name is Leila Jungberg. And nowadays, I actually work as a consultant at a bureau called Doings. And we have the humble aim, uh, as I would presume that many of you have, to make this world a little bit of a better place, uh, person by person, team by team, and organization by organization. So that's just briefly who we are. And I'm really, really happy to be here today to talk about teaming, because collective intelligence is really what I strongly, strongly believe in. And you can just see that by the power of all of you here today. Uh, that's a collective with a bunch of intelligence that I know of, seeing a lot of your names on the list. So uh, it's going to be super interesting to see how we can leverage that today. Um, yeah. Can we just say that if they have any questions, they can write it in the chat and there will also be an opportunity afterwards to, to, to address the questions to Leila. So sorry for that. Yes, that's how we will manage the collective intelligence. So write in the chat box, Ingela will help me out to see if you have asked something. Uh, that's super nice. And I will leave some time by the end as well, if you have anything that you want to ask me, but I would also like to hear from you to talk more about teaming. So this is the team that I work with every day. Uh, and we work a lot with uh, coaching, team development, and organizational change. Uh, we, were, we do that from a lot of leadership questions, a lot of culture questions, trying to make sure that um, companies are living and doing their very, very best. Let's see if this works. Yes. And these are our values and principles that we live by, which actually made me choose doings. Because if you look at these pretty closely, you can see that they are really, really closely connected to the agile values, uh, which made me think that this is the perfect match. We will work so greatly together. And that actually stands true. We believe in a co-leadership. So we are 17 people, 18, I think, actually nowadays, that are doing that together, co-leading ourselves to live according to our values. So just briefly, uh, <clears throat> yeah. I've struggled. <laughs> I have one work life where I mostly struggled <laughs> upstreams. Uh, and, and in that work life, I actually met Pia Mia and many others from the Agile People community, other, other heroes out there struggling to <laughs> create something else. Uh, I really wanted to see if there were another way that we could work together that was well suited towards being a human being with other human beings where we were supposed to leverage this, you know, brain we have here inside of us. Because everywhere where I looked, that were not really what we were doing. And uh, I, I continued this quest for many years. Uh, I tried to work from the HR box. And fortunately, what happened to me was that in a very early stage, I was at the IT consultancy firm and I discovered a competence network that was focusing on working in agile ways. This made me super curious. What, does, what is all of this about? And I really quickly realized that these values, they were really resonating with me and they were resonating with being a human being, leveraging this um, capital that we have inside of our heads and really working authentically with that. So I worked as a 
people and culture manager in uh, many different global organizations for many years. And I try to build HR functions from the notion of the ag agile values and principles. Um, so that is kind of what you can see in these pictures, my, my constant struggle. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, I realized that something has changed and shifted. Uh, people wanted to work in this way. So that became an opportunity to me uh, to really kind of a little bit let go of the struggle. Uh, and I joined Doings to work a little bit more with these type of questions that I was really passionate about, which was all about, you know, coaching individuals, growing teams and growing organizations from these perspectives. So that is actually what I do mostly nowadays. And I would say that a majority of my time has been spent with teams and figuring out different teams, uh, to, different ways for teams to be as engaged and as efficient that they can be. And I love that. It's so much fun. Which brings us to today's topic. I met Ingela the, the other month, actually. It wasn't this month. It was another month. And we were at this lunch webinar. And we started to talk about teaming, actually, because it's so interesting about how we do that nowadays. What actually works and how can we apply theories into practical cases? So we started talking about that. And so we ended up here uh, having this little stories from reality thingy with all of you. So I'm going to walk you through this today. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to give you a very brief, brief introduction to three different fantastic, mighty researchers that has uh, a lot of thinking and theories that have been studied and applied on teaming and group development. And then I'm going to talk a little bit um, about how I actually apply these different theories in real life, in practicality, with a few of uh, customer cases that I brought here for you today. And of course, I would like to trigger your own thinking in this, and it would be really interesting to hear in the end what you think works really well when you work with team development or building teams. What is working for you? And how do you leverage different theories? Okay. So I'm going. Are you ready? Yes. This lady, she's a mighty one. <laughs> so I will not deep dive into the different theories, but I will talk a little bit about what I personally like with them. And I will also talk a little bit about what the critics say about them. Um, so for you who don't know, psychological safety has been booming uh, for a few years now. So this theory is about how we create an environment for teams where they can be as efficient as possible, as engaged as possible, when we have a lot of complexity around us and we have an uh, environment that requires us to be really good problem solvers or really creative thinkers. So in that context, how can we become the best possible versions of ourselves? So you can read and see here on the slide about the definition about psychological safety from Amy Edmondson. There are a few other ones as well, but let's focus on her for, for this session today. So psychological safety is a belief that no one will be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. So that is her definition of what psychological safety is. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about how you can create that. But I wanted to tell you first that what I do like with psychological safety, talking about practical application, is how well suited psychological safety actually is when you have complex environments, when you have uh, a lot of uncertainties, a lot of unknown areas, and you really need to have a strong collaborative environment for the team. And you need, need to be able to uh, get the most innovation power uh, out of people that are involved. So I think uh, that is my personal take on how psychological safety has been really suitable when I meet teams that are in that type of environment. So let's just look a little bit on how you do it. So um, I really like this uh, short uh, 
cheat sheet, we can call it, that the Amy uses herself. And she talks about hardware or software of teams. So for me, this has been a really good like checklist while working with teaming uh, in this case. So you need to have the hardware, a lot of structural things. Like we need to scope what type of challenge we are looking at. Why are, why are we a team? What are we trying to accomplish? We need to understand that to be able to find the expertise in the team that is needed. And when we know what we are doing, we need to talk about how we actually are building value. How do we do things? And then, of course, if we have a complex environment, this question, sorting priorities and interdependencies, is not as easy as it might seem. That could be really complex, but who is doing what first and what do we need to succeed? So those are more of the hardware, the structural things in regards of psychological safety. And then we have the software of psychological safety that is, you know, understanding and connecting to a deeper purpose of, of why we are doing things. What are we doing and why? And this is, of course, good for many different benefits, but mostly it triggers internal motivation to do things and it creates uh, a glue in the team that sticks us together. And we also talk about how we are doing things. And this is something that helps us to, you know, let go of that energy to to constantly drain ourselves with figuring out how we're doing things. Rather, we talk about it very explicitly, so it's out there. And then, of course, the hot question of learning, actually. So it, it does seem simple on the surface, but we all know that if we are in teams with a little bit more higher diversity, both if it's demographical or neurodiversity, it requires a little bit more from us. And there will be divergent ideas, there will be mistakes, and it's really good also to have made it more explicitly how we actually handle that type of learning. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to dive any deeper into psychological safety. I'm, I'm presuming most of you have heard of it. And if you haven't, I, I hope that you will be curious to learn more after this session. But I'm also going to highlight actually what some critics talk about when they um, hear psychological safety. So one thing is cultural variation. And that would be also interesting to see if there are some of you here from, from other cultures rather than my perspective, which is one specific one. Uh, but some critics says that there is an aspect of cultural variation, which does not make psychological safety universal. Uh, rather, you can see that it is influenced by uh, different types of cultures and it doesn't apply straight away to, to all type of cultures that we have around us. And there are also potentials for misuse. This is something that I actually meet very often that psychological safety is seen to, as a way to, you know, be, be really nice as an example, just be nice to each other, uh, which is a bit of a misunderstanding of what psychological safety is. But if you just dive into it very briefly, that might be how you perceive a psychological safety, which might also uh, be something that could create some confusion of how it actually should be working in reality. Mm -hmm. So that was Amy Edmondson and psychological safety. Uh, a little bit of what I like about it, a little bit about what the critics say about it. Uh, I'm moving on to another mighty woman. Uh, this is Ruth Wagemann. I don't know if you have heard of, about her. Uh, she's not as famous as Amy is, but her research is pretty impressive. Um, so the thing I like with Wagemann's research is that she has a lot of recent research. We're talking about the 30 years that has been upcoming for now. So it's pretty recent research, even though it's very uh, longitudinal. Um, and she has been looking at efficiency for leadership teams a lot, uh, which has been relevant for me because I've worked a lot with teaming for leadership teams as well. But she has also looked at other teams. And she has found these six conditions uh, that collectively could lead up to, predict up to 80% of team efficiency. So it's pretty solid research and that's impressive for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the thing with Wagemann's research is that it's very uh, similar 
but a little bit more concrete in structure towards Edmondson's research on psychological safety. So they're really like well suited together. Let's look at it a little bit closer. So maybe this picture is a little bit small for you, but I'm going to read you through it. So you can see there are two triangles in this picture, and it's actually a chronological order of these different triangles in her model. So the first triangle is what you're supposed to kind of walk through first. And the top of that triangle says real team. <laughs> so uh, this is actually a really tricky question that I've um, met myself during a lot of I made a lot of mistakes in this area during the years. I've tried to create teams of a bunch of people who are not really a, a real team. Uh, and this is the hard way to do this lessons learned. So I can just tell you this directly, that that doesn't work. <laughs> uh, people do not want to work together if they are not actually not a real team because there are no, uh, there, there are no genuine need for each other in that context. And I've tried to do this actually from the agile perspective because I've thought, you know, okay, but we are all, okay, we are HR, we are finance, we are IT, we are all here to make something great for the employees, as an example. That was like my really naive idea of how to create the team in this context. But the thing is, like, IT, finance, and HR had really like not the same goals in this and maybe not the same perspective and maybe not even the same value base actually to stand from. So uh, that is something I've, I've, um, I've uh, worked upstreams with a lot of times during the years, trying to create teams of groups of people who actually are not a team. So it's a good question to ask yourself, actually. It's very existential, but it starts there. Are we a real team? Is this a real team? And if it is, what is this team's purpose? And if you dive into Wagemann's research a little bit deeper, you will see that she has also like different alternatives for this. Like when we're talking about the team's purpose, there are a bunch of different purposes that could stand true for this team. Um, but yeah, so is this a real team? And if it is, what is the team purpose? As you can see, very closely connected to Edmondson's uh, hardware and the software of teams as well. And so uh, we are also talking about who are in the team and why are we in the team. And in this case, we are referring to, you know, competencies and roles, which expertise is needed again to be able to create our mission at hand. And maybe we're also missing somebody. That could be the case as well. So does this team have a compelling purpose? Mm -hmm. So compelling is kind of a key word in this as well. And it is, again, we're talking about internal motivation. That is the thing, because we know that when we trigger this area in the brain, we will have more grit. We will have more stamina. We will stand tall through the challenges that we will meet as a team. So co-creating a compelling purpose is one of the core structures here. And then we go to the lower triangle. And as you understand, if we have these three parts first, we have cleared out some foundational questions about teaming together. But the, the lower triangle here, that asks, what is the structure of this team? Do we have a sound structure for this team? And I, I think this is... Um, it's very easy to see if you work with a leadership team, but also in other teams that, you know, they might have those first three questions in check, but maybe they haven't worked so much on making the structure of this team explicit. How we actually are building a structure and value together, how we are communicating with other teams, what we're doing in which orders, et cetera, et cetera. And then I think this question is really interesting because uh, this is an external perspective of the team that is not maybe often looked at. Do they have a supportive context? So does this team have a supportive context? And I like this because this resonates with the servant leadership, you know, that we're building foundations or structure in an organization that actually helps this team to be their very best. But this could also be about, you know, training, it could be about resources, all types of things around the team that can make the team even better. And then, I don't know if this is a really smart sales trick from Wagemann, or if it's just meant for us consultants in general, or no, I have a personal view on this, of course, but she talks about team coaching. There is an upside of having a neutral facilitator who helps the team to develop and go through their evolutionary phases. Um, 
of course, this could be some someone external like me. You can hire me, of course, but it could also be <clears throat> uh, somebody in the team who takes on this role. And I think it's a good thing to do within the team to take on the facilitator role and to actually um, shift. So different persons works on developing the skill set. But that is mostly maybe from my personal point of view that I think facilitating is, you know, the leadership for the future. And Wagemann talks about essentials for the first triangle. And then she talks about enablers for, for the later triangle. And I think this is really connected to this. A facilitating skill set is really an enabler for a group's evolution to become more engaged and efficient. Yes, so <clears throat> what I like about Wagemann's uh, model and way of thinking with six condition is that this is really clear. It's a really solid, clear structure. You can dive deeper into this and you will have questions and, and more details in the different parts. I, I really like that. Um, what critic says is that there are some rigidity in the conditions, like they're a little bit too rigid sometimes, which makes it harder to apply in all team contexts. And the critics also say that it overemphasizes a little bit on structure. Uh, when you have a more dynamic and fluid team, it might be harder to leverage this structure. So, um, that is a little bit of my point of view and a little bit of the critics' point of view on Wagemann's research about teaming. Okay, this lady is maybe somebody you recognize as well. So uh, we can't talk group development if we're not referring to Susan Whelan, huh? It's kind of a must-have in this mix. Uh, I think it's also interesting because we, Whelan's perspective applies a little bit of another dimension in regards to Edmondson's and to Wagemann's uh, research. But as you know, Whelan has built on, on Tuckerman's theory of group development. And what she is looking at is more of the natural group development over time. You know, all of these different developmental phases that a teams go through. So... Uh, the good thing that her research shows is that usually when you work just with looking at the different phases that a team go through with a team, that the team themselves becomes really, you know, skilled on recognizing the different signs of which kind of evolutionary phase they are in, that actually brings more team efficiency in engagement because the team feels more ownership, they become more skilled at moving from one phase into another. So um, that is just really short on uh, Whelan's theories. I'm also going to just uh, show you this picture. If you don't know about Whelan's theories, this is what they look like. So uh, you usually use the metaphor of a person growing up when you talk about Whelan's um, natural team development phase. So first you're in this more polite phase uh, where you have the dependency and inclusion. And then when things have been polite for a while, you start to go into conflict when you realize that you have things that you think differently about and you want to disagree a little bit upon to be able to get to the next phase. Uh, the conflict phase. And then when you have gone through that, you are supposed to have more of the trust and the structure, which uh, naturally happens when you've gone through the hard times together as well. And then you get to a higher performing stage. And then there's a, also a closer phase in this. But I think most of you have seen Susan Wheeler's model before, maybe even tried out GDQ, which is the test questionnaire connected to this, where you actually can work a little bit more closer, closer on this. So I personally think that it's really good and easy language to, to leverage Whelan's, you know, this analysis of where a team is at when I go into a new team to kind of recognize what has happened here, where are they at right now, where do we need to go? And I also like that you can pro provide the team with the self-efficiency of actually themselves making these analyses, being able to recognize where they're at in their journey. So some of the critiques towards uh, Whelan's theories is that there are somewhat of an overgeneralization uh, that is oversimplified uh, with the team dynamics. And it's a bit more of a linear approach. So it's a little bit harder to apply in more complexity or when you have more of this fluid space the team are acting with. Um, so 
that is just really briefly on, on Whelan's theory and how I like it and what the critics say. Hmm? So the good thing with these mighty researchers and their theories is that they are really good to just mix together. Uh, I love that. Uh, I love to to take the best parts of, of theory and apply into practical uh, scenarios. So what we can see that is similar for all of these three theories is that they are both very focused on team effectiveness and they're very also focused on team interdependencies that we are realizing that we are dependent of each other within a team to be able Able to create what we want to have, the outcomes of the team. The differences between these teams is that they have a bit of different approaches to teaming and how that works. Um, they have a bit of different views on the environmental perspective around the team uh, and also what type of conditions a team need. And they're also focusing a little bit more, depending on which theory you look at, at the individual in the team context or the, the team as a collective, uh, a group that is moving together. Just to highlight that. But I think that <clears throat> the, the most important part to realize as well is that they are all working very well together. Um, so I'm really curious to see how you are thinking when uh, you are maybe meeting a new team and you're trying to help them to move on forward, uh, maybe just becoming better or maybe resolving something that has been tricky. But this is a bit of the questions that I'm thinking about when I'm meeting a new team to understand where they are currently at. And since I'm a consultant, I need to do this pretty quickly, actually. Uh, there's no slack because they charge me by hour or I charge them by hour. So <clears throat> this needs to be an efficient process. Uh, so I'm usually looking at, you know, uh, what, what is uh, this team supposed to do together? Why do they need each other? Why are there supposed to be a team? A pretty provocative question sometimes, but sometimes really good to just realize and go back to basic. It's a bit of, of understanding the why in a really deep level. And this is something you can ask, of course, if there's a team leader or a team manager, uh, or yourself, if you're a team leader or a team manager, but also the individuals in the team, because it's really interesting to see if this is something that is really well anchored with all, or if this is a question that still has um, a bit of unclarity to it. And it also directs the rest of the efforts that you want to do when you need to understand who are in the team, um, who needs to be in the team, maybe if there are not, uh, if there are competencies or role missing. When you need to understand where the team is at, it's also good to see uh, what they are supposed to go do together. Some type of background, you know, there could be conflicts or things that has been happening before or there have been a lot of movement uh, and you recognize that this is maybe not a stable team, it's more of a fluid team uh, and that is the context that they are acting in and it will be that way, that requires certain things. And then of course, what, what type of structure do they have already? What does it look like right now? So these are a few of my questions um, and, and the things that I'm thinking about when I meet a new team. And I really uh, mix all of the theories actually when I do this. And I'm gonna um, be even more explicit in how I actually do this with a few of team cases. And when I talk about these team cases now, feel free to, you know, drop a question in the chat box or raise your hand if you want to ask something. <clears throat> I, I won't be able to dig into details uh, from the customer and team aspect, but maybe in how I apply theory. So a quizzer. This is one of my customers uh, where I have a role as a I usually say as a janitor or something similar because I do a little bit of everything and what is needed at certain times. Sometimes it's sweeping floors, sometimes it's building something new, or sometimes it's making sure that the elevator is working. Um, <clears throat> but this is um, a scale up uh, that works with educational technologies. Um, they are spread all over the world. Uh, so it's a really hybrid team setup. They, they have a few offices, they have a few persons that are like, uh, you know, alone in different parts of the world because they need to, um, they have a global customer base. 
they are in some kind of scale up phase. So uh, things are moving fast. <laughs> there are never enough hands. Uh, I think a lot of you recognize this phase to be in. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a lot of change. It's constant change. So um, I've I've done a lot of different things with these companies, but in this case, we're focusing on, on team development and uh, working with the CEO as well. Because I think that the thing here with, with uh, this customer in this case is that when you have fluid teams, which I think psychological safety is a really well-suited theory for, uh, you need to be able to create, you know, both um, a big structure uh, uh, that enables uh, this psychological safety to happen in smaller context because the team needs to be uh, set up in a fast and small structure and then it might be, you know, let go of and then there might be another team constellation. Um, so in this case, it's a lot about creating both a uh, organizational structure for the smaller teams to be able to set it up. Uh, and that is also very highly connected to each and every individual in the company to be able to have the self-awareness, the self-leadership to see and build small teams and contribute to small teams as they need. So in this case, we have been working on the organizational purpose a lot. And we have also been working on making sure that each individual is connecting to that overarching purpose a lot. Uh, because the team purpose is a bit harder in this context because it's constantly fluid. So the team purpose might be set up in a smaller context depending to need towards a certain customer in different times. But we have worked a lot on the bigger structure and the individual um, um, self-leadership from that perspective. So they both have this common language that where they actually can refer to psychological safety and how you do that and how they contribute to that, but also that they have the organizational structure presets to be able to do that uh, in the bigger picture. This also becomes more important when you have a lot of remote and hybrid working team members because um, a lot of things within psychological safety is about minimizing the threat response to make sure that we can be the best version of ourselves. And if you are supposed to do that, you need to be clear on the structure that you have for different things. Like, how do I give feedback in this organization? If I have an idea for the product, where do I go? Or if I want to connect to other team members and then I'm a all alone here in my country, in my home office, how do I connect with them? What kind of areas and surfaces is there for me to connect to others? So a lot of, you know, organizational setup from that perspective and co-creating and refining that together for them to be able to feel that they have the presets in the organization to be able to contribute and build the psychological safety they need together. Mm? So uh, the case at Quizzer has been a lot about growing fluid, safe teams together. And I think that psychological safety has been the theory that I, I definitely apply the most here to be able to provide them with what they need in this kind of constantly moving uh, team structure. Okay, I'm moving on. So the Red Cross. <laughs> Uh, so uh, this has been a really interesting uh, assignment as well because it's changed a lot uh, during the process. And I would say the most important thing in this case actually has been the question of a real team. Is this a real team? So the mission at first was actually to uh, work with one isolated team in the organization to see if they could try out more agile ways of working. And if that then later on could be applied to other teams in the organization as a whole. So a bit of uh, experimental uh, first case, super interesting. Uh, the challenge was though <laughs> that this team was actually like four teams that had been uh, just merged to one team. And uh, we had this you know, ambition in the beginning to work with directly the agile ways of working, uh, moving on right into those kind of practices. But in this case, which we <laughs> realized after failing a bit, that's, that's how I do it. I fail a bit and then I realize new things, was that uh, 
uh, it's not doable to jump into the agile ways of working without understanding if this is a real team uh, and if it's not, uh, what is a real team here? Uh, so we started out with the ways of working. We realized, me and the team manager in this case, that this was not the path that we could take to move on forward. Um, and we changed the scope. So what we instead did was to structure up the real teams within these teams to understand what are a team in this context? What is the scope of their challenge? There, there was, of course, just to be clear, already very clear missions for these different teams that were merged that they were supposed to work with. The problem was just that we couldn't just merge these four different um, team challenges or scopes to one because they were too different and there were no natural dependencies of each other if we would just have merged them to one. Um, so the we question. actually, yes, question. Yeah, the question is, uh, what did you do in the team development sessions? Yeah. So we we sep we started with separate them, them actually because we realized that we couldn't work with them all together as one. And in, in this team development session, it was a, a lot about defining the scope and the challenge of their mission at first. So kind of containing that, structuring that so much closer in co-creation, of course, with that natural team. Uh, what is the, the scope and the challenge? Where should we cut and slice it? And when the challenge was a little bit more clear, working on um, that team's way of working. And in this case, there were a lot of changes, actually, a lot of structural changes. So I would say in this case, it was... Um, both in the beginning to realize that, okay, when we when we put all of these persons together in the room, there's um, the, uh, you could apply Willen's theory to the to this because you saw that there is something really wrong here. It does not work as it should. Um, and then when we separated them, you could apply Whelan's theory again because you could see that they were in so different phases, all of the different teams, and they needed a little bit of different things. So one team needed to work really uh, a lot with, you know, what's the what's the scope and challenge ahead. Another team, they needed new roles. They actually needed to shift roles and they needed um, different competencies in different roles. And then a third team needed to work a little bit more on the, their ways of working. So we separated it into these different team working uh, value tracks instead and work with this during a long time actually to figure out and make it a bit more clear for each of these teams what they were doing how they were working and which roles were needed so a lot of change uh, on both structural and behavioral areas as well and in the end they could actually come together and start working on their agile manifesto they had their own um uh, principles that they uh, could start to co-create and then they could do that uh, all of them together because it was more on a principle basis and they could start to see that they had synergies across the teams that still could be pliable in case of learning uh, mostly from each other and leveraging insights across the different teams. Uh, so that was kind of an <laughs> a interesting process uh, that I learned a lot from myself in, uh, in how to work with analyzing uh, teams and working with real teams. I hope that uh, gave some answers on the team development sessions. Uh, I can talk a bit more about that in this last case as well. Uh, so I might have Cecilia online. I don't know. That would be fun. Um, Cecilia is uh, one, a CHRO at Exilum, uh, one of my customers as well, uh, where we have been doing a lot of things together. And they have also worked a lot with teams in this company actually as well. But uh, Cecilia came to me with a specific team in mind. So this was also a really different case from the other two. So this was a specific team who were in a challenge. Uh, and the aim was to get back to a stage where this was a really trusting and high performing team because they needed to be really innovative, uh, which is one of the core competencies that this company has have. And they needed to leverage that even more in this specific team. So there had been a, a, a conflict earlier and 
the result in this has also been that there was not this, you know, even airtime in this team, but rather a few persons had a lot more airtime. And this, uh, this, you know, it's a super nice team and all of that. But the thing is that you couldn't leverage the full innovation of the full collective's intelligence here. So what we did was a very structured approach here with uh, different team development sessions and then some individual coaching as well between uh, the manager and the team members. So I think that was really key in this as well, because since there had been a conflict, it would have been super challenging to walk in for me to, as a team facilitator to walk into this team when the conflict was, you know, in full blossom. That would probably not have worked very well. So the team manager had already worked with the individuals who were involved in this case um, and have talked a lot about this. And it was like, you know, at the uh, at the calmer, calmer level. And these persons, these individuals were really ready to take the next step. So I think that was an important preset uh, for me to be able to come in here and deliver value when I was working with the whole group in these team development sessions. So in this case, we worked a lot with psychological safety. Um, and we also uh, worked a lot with the real team question because this is a matrix organization with uh, cross-functional teams. So in this case, this is a team that um, had a specific purpose together, but maybe not uh, the same purpose as, as most teams have uh, because they shared purpose with other teams as well. So we actually had three very structured questions where we uh, sessions where we worked first on the team purpose, why are we a team and and how are we working together? And each in each of these sessions, we did this co-creation phase together, but I also gave them a commun communicative tool of some sort for each session to be able to improve their uh, communication skills with each other at the same path. So. We worked with, you know, the purpose of the team and then we practiced active listening or we worked with ways of working in the team. How would we want to behave towards each other? How are we doing things? And then we practiced a feedback method. Um, so these, this was the setup of the three different team sessions um, to be able to get to a stage where they felt more safe uh, to express um, how they were feeling or uh, their ideas, divergent ideas when co-creating and doing innovation together. But they also became a little bit better at facilitating how they work together since that was a bit of the challenge to be able to get to this stage of more of an innovative climate when, when they were supposed to create things together. Mm -hmm. So I would say in this case, I worked a lot with both Wagemann and Edmondson's theory, psychological safety and six conditions for a team to be able to uh, provide them with the structure uh, that they needed uh, to uh, work in a more innovative way. Structure and innovation, that's how it goes. Cool, so uh, now I've been talking for so much time, I can't hear my voice anymore. <laughs> uh, but. I'm curious to hear from you. Uh, I'm really curious to hear from you what you think works or if you have any questions for me uh, talking about how you apply theory into practice. Yeah, we have a question from Jonas Album. Um, do you want to address it yourself maybe? Because I missed that. It was about the first example. Please. We cannot hear you. Yeah. Jonas, are you there? <laughs> we cannot hear you. So um, he, what he's asking is, how did you come up with this setup? and uh, workshops with the whole team online then? Sorry, the whole team, what was the your first uh, uh, workshop with the whole team and did you do it online? Um, was this for the first case with the, the quizzer? Yeah, 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 okay, cool. Um, so 
yeah, that has been uh, uh, not a straight, uh, straight uh, cut line process, but um, uh, we we have worked a little bit with different ways actually. But I think uh, the 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 one thing that made the most uh, impact, which I could see at least, that's a problem with hybrid. Huh? <laughs> you don't you don't know. <laughs> uh, but uh, the thing is, we they had an all hands, a physical all hands, where uh, they gathered the whole company, and when they did that, it was like for a week or something like that. Uh, then we we took the opportunity to make a bigger. Um, uh, both educational and co-creating thing where we worked with the team purpose uh, behaviors to to succeed with this and actually also which organizational structures forums meeting spaces they needed to be able to do this and i think uh, that physical room was really well needed to uh, to make sure that people went home back you know into the remote space and felt like they knew now that this was okay and that I could use this because this is also one of these companies where cultural differences has cultural variation <laughs> is a is a big question because the employees are from all of, over the world so a lot of different cultures mixed up together but yeah physical uh, and if I would have done it in another way we would try to made it of course remote uh, but I would have preferred at least to do one thing physical or a first thing physical um, and then the next thing remote that's um, because that's how we have worked afterwards as well thank you we have a question from Matthias Matthias Wahlberg would you like to Yeah, I, I'm. I'm. I'm curious about how we can um, uh, move from the the typical stable teams setup where we where we um, say uh, need to reteam more and more often to handle uh, cross value stream uh, collaborations. Any ideas? Any tips? Yeah, I'm. I'm so happy you brought this up because maybe I haven't or I haven't had the chance to talk about this but this has been one of my like trickiest challenges like do we even have stable teams anymore is that a thing nowadays uh or maybe do we only have teaming like the verb that we're like constantly doing teaming because everything is fluid around us all the time and i think that what uh, for me has been a key as a facilitator for teams uh, which i also try to to work with team managers and team leaders on is to take these theories like psychological safety as an example, hardware and software for teams or Wagemann's, you know, conditions or something that has this structure thing to it and make it in a smaller format when you go into a fluid team. Like, am I only working with this team for like two or three months? I could still leverage a lot of those structural components to make sure that some mm, threatening stuff that could be on people's brain is taken care of and cleared out like why we're doing things how we're doing things um, and even to make a small investment in co-creation of that not telling as a manager or a facilitator how it is but having that element of co-creation even though it's really small uh, makes the engagement I think personally it's, it's my experience I can't I don't have any research to back this up. It's just my experience that that makes it a lot more efficient. Do you have any other ideas yourself? No, I'm, I'm, I totally agree that there's a lot of um, progress and, and value to, to be found when you invest time in that way. But from my point of view, I, I, I see from organizations a tendency to invest in the hardware setup of the team and less on the software setup mm -hmm. and how can we how can we show them the value of investing also in the software of the team mm. Mm. yeah good question so that's a challenge for me yeah yeah if you have the answer so please <laughs> please provide me with those insights and i would leverage that to all my customers okay thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> no, but mm -hmm. I, I think I, I think you're onto something uh, because the thing is that the hardware of the team uh, is is also sometimes set up already in an organization. Like it's it's clear, 
but I think uh, the software of a team is a lot about the co-creational phase. For me, uh, one key has been in understanding that the leadership of the future requires facilitation. That's like key. Because if you're a good facilitator, you can facilitate these things in the smallest of contexts, in a hybrid context, in a real life context, in short and long term. So uh, I would invest in facilitation uh, as a company or as a team or as a manager or whatever. But I know it's, it's, it's always a challenge of making somebody realize this investment. Uh, great outcomes yeah. from the team later on, maybe. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Great. Thank you. We have uh, a question from Kashik also. Do you want to address it yourself? Um, am I aud Hi, am I audible? Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, my uh, question is... Uh, a bit specific to teams that are following uh, the Agile methodology. And uh, uh, well, what I'm curious about is to understand if uh, it's a good practice that uh, a team that's following the Agile methodology, which kind of states that, okay, teams need to be flexible enough to um, accommodate ad hoc work that comes in. Uh, is is that kind of a good practice uh, to have multiple focuses or have situations where you need to shift focus every now and then? And uh, uh, related to that, is is uh, how is such a team uh, going to be able to achieve um, like a high performance? Um, you know, how is that kind of a team going to reach that stage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think you're addressing one of our hardest challenges in modern time. Like if we're if we're moving from the notion of, of what we just talked about, the teams and environments being constantly fluid, <laughs> uh, we see that okay, so we need to create a space to be able to context switch, or we need to create a space where we're able to handle multiple uh, value streams at one time. <laughs> On the other hand, we also know that the human being is not made for context switching. We know that context switching costs a lot every yeah. time we do that. And of course, if you think about this as an individual, then you have to multiply it when you put it into team context. Because if we're context switching and doing multiple things at a time in a team context, it costs even more because it also requires understanding in between us to be able to get an outcome from, from every time we're switching to a new value track. I think you know there is a there is a core value that we we might have lost uh, during the time in VIT limits, you know, work in progress limits, and how much things we are supposed to do at one time. I think also there is uh, a strong value in in trying to um, uh, organize for chaos, uh, as I like to call it. You know, we have a solid structure where we keep an awareness. Uh, to be able to be resilient in the face of change, that things are going to change. Like that that's a constant that, and that we know that that is happening. So we need to kind of build that in, in the system. But I also think there should be a balance. Oh, sorry, this is like a really consultant answer. It's not so much buts and ifs and maybes. <laughs> but, they, but they need to be a balance because otherwise we know that we won't finish anything. What are you thinking yourself? Um, well, for me uh, personally, I feel in this kind of situation, like with the four stages uh, that a team yeah. can be in that you uh, showed in one of the points earlier, I think if a team has like a solid focus on one goal, for example, yeah. and diligently and consistently uh, works towards that, then I think that team, it would be easier for that team to move from stage one to stage four and become more mature uh, and high performing uh, than a team uh, which has uh, these sort of you know shifting of context uh, all that it take it i i feel that it will take that kind of a team more time to become uh, mature and high performing yeah. in that sense so i was just trying to like uh, uh, to wrap my head around how can we strike a balance where yeah. the team is handling both yeah. addressing both that issue that okay if they need to 
do the context switching. They can handle it. And at the same time, they are also kind of progressing towards becoming more mature as a team. Yeah. So, in a very yeah i i think you're right and like like striking the balance that's kind of the key and i would like from a very practical standpoint just recommend to work really hard with retrospectives like and when you do the retrospectives you don't work only with what we have done and accomplished to realize how much change we can handle during one period of time but also mm -hmm. how we are progressing as a team there are so many teams that are like a little bit too loose uh, with the retrospectives nowadays i think you should like be a little bit more struck, strict about that from the team needs at certain points of time. Like, so this happened during this sprint. How this did it actually work for you? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I see. So you're saying that individually uh, we need to address that to the team members that how did it work for you in this sprint or something like that? I would yeah. do it in a group context with a retrospective after a period of time. Yeah. Both the what and the how. Yeah. I see. Thank Good you. luck. Yes. Tell me how it goes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Yeah. Thank you. We have one more question, if you have time. Uh, it's from Pontus. Maybe you would like to address it yourself. Yeah, hello. Uh, I was uh, thinking about conflict handling or conflict resolution, which I think is a very important thing with teams and do it structurally. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yes, this is super important. And this is something you want teams to be kind of self-sufficient in as well. So you don't have to go for the external consultant part. Um, so uh, uh, in one of these cases that I actually had, uh, I uh, I also, I, I, I told you that I was providing them both co-creation of how to work as a team, but also communicative tools for each session. So this was part of one of these communicative tools. How do we, uh, how do we work when we have different point of views, which, you know, the first stage of a conflict kind of, <laughs> uh, and how can we become better at meeting each other when we're at that stages? So I think this is something that uh, gives so much return on invest to in invest in providing people with communicative tools to be able to solve their own differences, both with self-awareness and, and uh, concrete ways of working with each other to get to that point. Um, yeah, that's my brief reply to that one. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um... Thank you. Thank you, Leila. It was very interesting listening to you. So interesting that I did not really <laughs> follow properly with the chat, but I think it worked uh, out in a way. So a big thank you. Uh, I really like the three ladies, uh, the researchers, uh, and you put it together in a very nice uh, setting. And um, uh, Wagemann, uh, she was a little bit new to me, but very interesting. So I will definitely dwell into learning more about that concept. Um, would you like to say something before we run? No, up? just um, I'm happy if you would share an insight in the chat box when you leave. I hope I sparked some curiosity. Uh, that's my main focus. Like if you become more curious, life will be funnier. Um, feel free to add me on LinkedIn if you have any further hot topics that we can discuss because this is my favorite topic to discuss. <laughs> Thank you so much, all of you, for being here yeah. today. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will share the recording. We will share uh, Leila's presentations in a mail afterwards. Um, we are already planned the next story from reality uh, for March, um, no, February, sorry. Uh, so I will uh, shortly come back with more information about that. Uh, so thank you for today. Thanks for attending us. I say yes, Leila, do. <laughs> please follow us on LinkedIn. <laughs> uh, and uh, look forward to meeting you all on the next story from reality. Mm, have a fantastic day.